Okay, so uh, here we are uh, in the middle of the Norfolk Broads. Hopefully going to be the first one of a new series that we're going to do and try and cover a few of the, the venues um, that we fish both in matches and pleasure fish in this area. Today we're on a bit of the, uh, the River Thurn at a place called Martham. It's actually free fishing, um, so you can come anywhere along here all the way between Martham Boatyard and um, Latham's of Potterheim, the bridge at Potterheim. Um, the, um, the parking here, there's actually a car park at Martham Boatyard where we've parked today, uh, five pounds a day or two pound fifty for four hours if you just fancy a, an afternoon session. But the actual fishing here, believe it or not, is free even though it's fabulous fishing. Um, we're actually on the same stretch that they had the 1966 World Championships on. So it has got a bit of pedigree here before. Um, now, I fished here at the weekend. It's the first time I've been on here this year. I've had such a busy season. I've not managed to fish it much this year. Um, but uh, I drew just a few pegs further up to the right. Had a lovely day, a 24 pounder skimmers. But um, I got beaten for the section by a, a, a Norfolk legend called Wevo. Um, he should be good at it because he's been practicing for the last 80 years, but he had 27 pounds, just missed out on the frame. So I thought I can't have that. So I've come back to have another practice and uh, try and catch a few fish today. So um, I'll talk you through the session, how we're going to do it. And um, like I say, hopefully over the next few sessions, we'll try and build up a bit of a picture of where you can go fishing on the Norfolk Broads, either for matches or if you're down here on holiday. Right, one thing I always like to do is uh, mix my ground bait in advance, either on the morning of the, uh, of the match at home or um, as we're doing today in the car park. I don't like to drag a load of extra weight like my drill, extra bait and whatever on the bank. And um, also, especially with these sort of venues where you've got pile banking, I think the sound carries um, really badly through water as well. So I, I really don't want to be making any extra noise or commotion on the bank. So um, today we're going to go for a simple mix. Um, I fished here actually at the weekend and we used uh, just a, a natural ground bait mix. I so just used river and sweet skimmer. But um, there was quite a lot of roach in the river and I've gone for a slightly stronger mix today, um, incorporating a little bit of fish meal into the mix as well. Um, what I found at the weekend was I had to feed quite a lot of bait in the ground bait to counteract the roach. So hopefully with a stronger mix, we can get away with feeding a bit more sensibly and catch the skimmers a little bit easier. Um, now, one thing with these sort of venues, a lot of people are, are dark ground bait mad at the minute, um, which in clear water is absolutely brilliant. But we're fishing in very coloured water today. There's a lot of boat traffic, a um, lot, uh, lot of wash from the boats, and it keeps colouring the water all the time. So I've gone for a natural coloured ground bait today. So I'm going to use normal F1, thatches and sweet skimmer in equal portions. Although we're hoping to catch a lot of fish today, not actually going to use a lot of bait. So uh, I'm going to measure it out and using a one pint tub, I'm just going to mix up three quarters of a pint of each of these three mixes to get a three part mix and then mix an equal quantity of water. So um, that way everything's absorbed in one go and it works very, very well indeed. The only other addition I'm going to do is put approximately a cap full of the bait booster in as well, just to add the actual sweet taste. So the, the salt of caramel is the same flavour what we get in Sweet Skimmer. It's a very brassamy caramel, um, sort of traditional bream flavour. And the sweetness of the liquid is going to complement the dry ground bait quite nicely in that as well. So we put a cap full in, three quarters of a pint of water, and then three lots of three quarters of ground bait. Mix it all in one go, and away we go. So basically we've got the um, three quarters of a pint of 
water in there with a cap full of the uh, bait booster and then our dry ingredients and it's just going to be a dead simple matter of mixing these all together in one go because everything's measured out it's going to come out perfect so everything in there together very quick mix up and that looks ruined already but because of the dry ingredients in there the expander pellets and whatever they take on an awful lot of water so three parts of ground bait to one part water that'll come out perfect so you can see already is starting to absorb that water very very quickly so we'll give that a few minutes as soon as it's absorbed it'll, it'll harden off quite a bit just push it through a riddle and you'll be back to a lovely soft fluffy mix right i'm just going to show you how um, our set rigs up for this sort of uh, venue. Now a lot of fishing on still waters, so I'll, I'll use braided line um, either in conjunction with a shock leader or straight through, but on most flowing water I actually like to use mono. Um, I think you get a nicer bow in the line, uh, you can fish nicer, you can hold bottom with a little bit less lead, um, and on places like this where there can often be a lot of skimmers move into the peg, um, you can read the line bites better and you, your rig just stays in position nicely. So I'm literally just going to use six pound sink and feeder mono straight through on the rig. Um, simple as that. And uh, in conjunction with a very, very simple self-hugging rig. Um, now, when I go away abroad or um, fish to international rules or anything like that, the rig's got to be completely free running, which is a bit of a pain on a river uh, because you could do with like that nice sort of um, bolt effect to get a nice drop back bite um, and for the fish to hook itself. Now luckily although we're in the centre of the world today we're not actually fishing to world rules so we can fish however we like. So I'm going to set um, a safe free running rig up but it has actually got a backstop so like I say just check the rules on if you're using this on a fishery or in a competition that this this is allowed but, um, but basically just got my normal six pound sinking feeder mono I'm going to twist that to make a twizzled boom. So I'm twisting each section of line in opposite directions. I'm not going to try and pull it down tight like you normally would with a twisted boom rig because it's left a nice large loop at the end for me to attach my hook length to. I've not had to knot that to make that loop. I've literally just started spinning and that loop has automatically formed. So I'm going to carry on spinning until I've got a length of twizzled line a little bit longer than what you'd normally make a twizzle boom rig so normally you'd have your twizzle boom that long I've just gone a little bit past that so I'm just gonna fold that over and pass this through three times to close that knot off so that's done just trim off the excess So just got a long twizzled boom and then all I'm going to do, waggle a link swivel, just pass that over the top. Now you'll see that's free to go over that knot and pass up the line. And then an inch and a half below that, going to tie another knot. So again just fold it over like before, through three times. and that has formed the rig that we're going to use. So you've got twizzle boom with two knots. Now all I'm going to do is put a start behind that knot. So this link swivel will come um, and sit behind that start. The reason why I've used a start, because it's got a flat side, you'll see it will kick off nicely. So I'll just put this on and show you how the rig sits. So here we go, this is, this is now the finished rig. So we've got the loop at the end for the hook length the stop that I've pinched over the two strands of line and then a back stop knot. So if a big fish takes, it's free to pull over the line, but when the rig is sitting in its fishing position with the bow going down in the line and the hook length facing downstream, when a fish picks up the bait and turns, that knot is enough to hook the fish and to give a drop back bite. But if it's a particularly savage bite, 
that can pull over and the rig still be safe. But uh, obviously in international rules, we're not allowed to have any backstop at all. But uh, for most river fishing, that's a deadly little rig. Um, Mick Viles and Alan Scotton came up with that for fishing the Trent many years ago in conjunction with a little diamond eye swivel. But, um, but I've found in practical terms, just a normal Waggler Link swivel is enough because of how the rig sits facing downstream. So simple as that. And like I say, the flat edge of the stock is an advantage because when the rig sits, that flat edge to the stock kicks that hook length away from the feeder at all times. And the little twizzle below the stock just needs to be a little bit longer than where the feeder would hang to. So as long as you attach your hook length below the bottom of the feeder, that's a very tangle free rig. So bait wise today, as I alluded to when I mixed the ground bait up back at the van, um, we're gonna, we've gone for a fish meal mix today. I actually used natural ground bait at the weekend um, and still had good results. So I used river and um, sweet skimmer then. Um, but now I've mixed F1, Thatcher's and sweet skimmer in equal portions. Um, but I've used the light um, coloured one. I think in the UK we're absolutely obsessed with dark ground baits, but as you can see here, the water's very, very coloured from all the, uh, all the boat wash. And I think a light ground bait, especially for skimmers and bream, um, is actually an advantage. But what I'm going to do, I'm go I'm, I've plumbed two lines to fish on the feeder. I've plumbed one line going across. It's quite a flat river. It's um, sort of like drops down to seven foot and then it's pretty much the same depth all the way across. So I've plumbed, plumbed across. Um, at the weekend I fished probably three quarters of the way across and I felt it was just a little bit too far. Um, so I've come just this side of that and then another line short where you'd normally fish a long pole. Um, now I was used to approach this place fishing a run and through float and a flat float but in recent years I've had much better results just fishing a small feeder on that line. I think it fishes a little bit quicker, it's a little bit nicer than trying to set up a flat float and um, the stamp of the fish is certainly a bit bigger as well. So I'm going to fish it with a bait up with a feeding feeder and then fish a small feeder over the top. Um, the only other thing I'm going to do is start on a four metre whip, virtually under the tip of the whip, still into the deepest water, just to get a few early fish while the, um, while the feeder lines are settling. Now what I've done for that, I've got all the normal ground bait mixed up, and then I've just put some molehill soil with a portion of that. Now that's going to be my mix for the, on the pole, and then the neat ground bait is going to be the mix for the feeder. Um, I find on all of these Norfolk River soils are very important. Uh, part for, uh, for pole fishing. It, it increases the accuracy where the balls go in, reduces the crumb content in relation to the particles as well, so the stamp of the fish is usually a lot bigger. You hear a lot of people using vast quantities of ground bait on here, but the stamp of the fish is usually tiny. So I always find that if you pole fish on here, cut the mix with soil and you'll have a much bigger stamp of fish and hopefully a much nicer day. Now, I've brought a few casters and a few maggots with me, but I don't expect to use hardly any of those. Um, I've just got them left over from the weekend. So I'm going to put a few casters in the pole mix to start off with. But bait for the day is pretty much just going to be worms. So I'm, I've got finely chopped worms to go in the feeder mix and uh, a few red worms to on the hook. Um, got a nice little supply of red worms. It's worth taking a day out, you know, maybe having a day off from going on a match and whatever and finding a nice supply of red worms. Anywhere what keeps horses um, is usually a good, good place to start. So uh, I've got a few red worms and a few dendrobinas. So, so on feeder the feeder line, line, I've plumbed up, three quarters across. It just starts to shallow up a little bit, but there's a little bit of weed and debris on the bottom collecting. So I've come back a little bit where I can just drag the bomb along the bottom. I've increased to like an ounce and a half bomb just to try and drag that along the bottom. And then the short line, I've actually wound in 10 turns on the reel and clipped up. So I've clipped both my rods up to the far line and then wound in 10 turns and clipped up. So I can fish the short line with both rods or the far line with both rods just by messing about with the line clip. I haven't got to have two separate rods for each line. Um, and then on the whip line, I'll just put a plumber on and I'll show you how that plums up. So I've not bothered with a long pole at all today. I think the presentation on the feeder gives a much bigger stamp of fish, but it's just handy to have a, 
a little start with a few roach and the odd skimmer on this just while those feeder lines are settling. So basically I've got a gram and a half rig, which is a simple Olivet and three droppers, four metre whip, and I'm going to fish directly under the tip of the whip. I'm not going to try and overstretch myself and go further out because the, the line will get caught in the wind. We've got quite a nasty downstreamer today. But you can see there, just by plumbing up directly below the whip, it's dropping off a little bit downstream. But if I come in closer, that depth carries on almost all the way to the bank. It's only now starting to come up literally two metres out from the bank. So I know that if I'm four metres out, I'm virtually in the full depth of the river, and it's a very flat river, that depth carries on across. Now you can see there, if I bring it upstream, it's almost varying by the length of the float. So there's a little depression in the riverbed there, and then it drops off there. So it's a horrible sort of peg for fishing a pole on. So what I've done to try and compensate for that, I'm going to push the float up a little bit so I'm definitely on the bottom. But although I've got six inch hook length, I've increased the distance up to the dropper shot. So if I drop the rig in and there's more line on the bottom at first, doesn't matter. Um, I'm still going to be able to inch that rig through and get nice presentation without the dropper shot getting hung up. If there's any problems, I can go deeper. I can move those dropper shot up accordingly as well. So um, that's how I'm going to start on the pole. Just going to start it off with a simple, just pop one ball of ground bait in with a few worms, a few casters, right on the end of the whip, bait up my feeder line, and then start on the pole um, while those feeder lines are settling. So I've got my normal very fine chopped worms. Um, I've put a handful of those into my feeder mix already, but because I'm going to leave the feeder line for a little while to settle while I start on the whip, I'm going to put a few much coarser pieces of worm in. So I'm literally putting them on the ground bait, just a few snips so they're almost hook bait size and I feel that they just sit in the peg a little bit longer than the fine worms that I'm going to feed as well. So you can see there you've got some much coarser bits of worms in there as well. Then on the pole line literally got very fine chopped worms and a few casters. Just going to put one ball of that in on the whip line and then use a bait up feeder to bait up the uh, the other lines. So I'm going to feed the, um, the two feeder lines in different ways. So I've got a larger bait up feeder for the short line. Um, that's only nine metres out. Uh, so it would be about where you'd fish an 11 metre pole due to the fact that your pole's further back. And when you cast in with a, with a rod, your rod's further forward. So I'm going to put um, six big bait ups on that line because I think we're trying to draw the fish there. Now the far line, I'm not going to put anywhere near as much bait on that because I feel like we're going to the fish on that line so I'm only going to put um, three slightly smaller rocket feeders on that line. Still a decent sized feeder but I've gone for a rocket on that one just so I can be dead accurate um, in this downstream wind and just put a little bit of bait in. So I'll get those in, get the swims fed and um, then start straight away on the whip and see how we get on while those two lines are settling. So the good thing about baiting up with these size feeders, although it's a, it's a big feeder, I can still cast it out with my normal fishing rod. So I've not had to set up a, a separate baiting up rod in this situation. We're on one of the smaller, more intimate rivers of the Norfolk Broads here. So my far line's only 18 metres and the near line's nine metres. So I'm using a 10 foot superior X for both lines. Now, um, I've got six pound sinker feeder mono on here. Now five pound would be ideal for the fishing, but just to give me a bit more durability for casting out these bait up feeders at the start and a bit more durability if we're winding in lots of bream, hopefully. Um, I've gone for six pound on the, the sink and feeder mono. Now, baiting up, a lot of people um, that I see will cast out a bait up feeder and then do a, a very big false strike to try and get the bait out of the feeder. But I always think that spreads the bait a little bit too much. You, you know, spreading it out by a metre, two metres. Now, Bear in mind, I'm only fishing nine metres out. I've not got a lot of room to play with, so I'm going to try and bait very accurately. So what I'm going to do is cast, follow the feeder to the bottom, and then almost um, shake the, the rod on the spot uh, to empty the feeder rather than doing a false strike. And I find that way it empties it very effectively, but the bait is contained in a much smaller spot, almost replicating what you try and do on the pole.
So just follow the feeder down. You can feel it hit the bottom there. Clip the bail arm over and literally shake the rod on the spot and that feeder's empty straight away. You can literally feel the ground bait come out of that feeder um, and that, that keeps it nice and accurate. So that's the baiting up done. I'll just get some fishing feeders on here, get some hook links on and away we go. So we're just making a start on the whip while the um, ground bait settles on the two feeder lines. Oh, little roach, little roach bite straight away there. We're having to fish a little bit over depth because of that sloping bottom in the swim, but uh, we should still be able to put a few fish in the net. I always like to leave those skimmer lines quiet. I think nothing attracts feeding fish better than other feeding fish. So the longer I can leave that, the, the bigger the reward, I think, when we do eventually go on that line. So just putting the rig in, just lowering the rig in, laying the line directly behind the float. Got a couple of number eight stops between the float and the um, pole tip just to uh, get round the uh, horrible downstream wind. And then I've just got normal pre-tied N10 hook, size 16 to 010 to start off with. Um, wouldn't have any hesitation in dropping down a little bit lighter than that, but I always think there's a chance of a skimmer or two even this close in. Um, so I've just started on a 16 to 010, just to give us a chance of any better fish if we, uh, if we were to catch them. There's been some fantastic weights on the pole in some of the re recent matches sort of big 20s, nearly 30 pound on hemp and tares of roach. It's been 50 pound on the long pole of uh, skimmers and bream. But um, like I said, we're gonna base our attack around the, uh, around the feeder today and um, just use this as a little filling method. But it really is, you, you know, it does work for what, however you wanna fish. This is a great river to, uh, to fish in whatever style you wanna you want to fish. Look for, this is a great river. So just very small roach to start off with. It's got a single caster on at the minute. Pretty much on the pole, all I, all I generally fish on here is either a single caster or the head of a dendrobina. I don't very often find that you have to scale down much below that. really is a horrible downstream wind today. It's making presentation very difficult. But uh, we're getting a few bites. Not really settled yet, but we're getting a few bites straight away. So anything that I catch on this is a, is a bonus, really, because it's allowing the feeder lines just to settle down a little bit. Right, so because I'm... Um, only using this as a fill-in method to start off with. I'm not doing any loose feed on this method at all. I'm just going to um, plop in the odd little ball of ground bait with uh, just a few worms and casters in and try and keep the fish in one spot. Obviously, if I was trying to build this and make it into a swim for the whole day, I'd be loose feeding, um, maybe potting in more regularly fishing a little bit further out but because it is literally like just a method for me for the first half an hour I can do that very accurately keeping the fish in one spot just um, just by plopping in the odd little ball of ground bait just keep it nice and tight just for a quick burst of fish at the start before we move on to the feeder lines it's hard to believe but the Norfolk Broads were actually uh, man-made of old uh, ancient peat diggings that over time have expanded and filled with water and uh, joined with all the rivers and produced this sort of fabulous natural fishery that we've got now. The, uh, the boat traffic and the holiday industry actually um, is a big benefit for the anglers. I know some people get frustrated with the uh, holiday boaters that, you know, they're literally out for the day and they, they don't know how to handle boats, but it sort of makes my blood boil a little bit when people give them abuse, because if it wasn't for the boats and the boaters, the rivers would be a, a shadow of what they are now. The, uh, the, 
constant boat traffic keeps good colour in the water, keeps predation down to an acceptable level. And uh, like I say, without the boats, these rivers would be suffering like a, a lot of the other ones are unfortunately in the country. But um, uh, yeah, it really is a, a fantastic set of venues that make up the, the Norfolk Broads. Split over several rivers and then um, several broads themselves. Um, this river, the River Thurn, it's quite a short river. It actually uh, springs up in a little village called Horsey, just upstream from here, which is very close to the sea, which you'd expect it to run out to the sea, but it actually starts near the sea and runs away from the sea until it eventually joins up with the River Bira just a little bit um, further down to our left before joining up with that and then running out into the sea at Great Yarmouth. So it's a very short river, but in terms of fishing, oh, dropped off, uh, a very important one. So uh, the river just upstream of here, in fact, it's peg one on the, uh, the matches what we fish, goes into a venue called Candle Dyke which is uh, quite a famous venue over the years. That then leads on to uh, a place called Horsley Mere and Hickling Broad, um, where it's previously caught the British record pike from there. Um, it's held the pike record on three occasions over the years. And uh, the uh, as well as producing big rudd, tench, and vast numbers of roach and bream, as you can see here. So the, uh, the broads are linked by these rivers. And then in about another month's time, a few weeks time, they'll start leaving this area and going into the boatyards and the uh, town centres for a bit more warmth. And the fishing will change completely. You can come here where it's literally a bite of cast now and you won't get a bite at all. Maybe last thing in the evenings, you might catch a fish or two, but the fish tend to leave all the open expenses of water and then um, go into one of the many boat yards around this area and they produce some fantastic winter sport if you can uh, get access to certain ones. But, um, so talking of pike fishing, we're, we're very close to where one of the last 40 pound Norfolk Broads Pike was recorded actually on this stretch where we're fishing today um, and not that long ago either and then the two previous records were both on Hickling Broad itself and the one before that on Horsey Mere was actually the first venue in the country to produce a 40 pound pike. Um, now being so close to the sea they actually have had problems with salt incursion before which has led to algae outbreaks called primnesium which uh, has completely wiped out fish stocks over the years but in terms of damage it only does short-term damage because every every time it happens the fisheries have recovered fantastically each time and uh, the fishing now is probably the best that it's ever been So we've been going for 30 minutes or so now. We've got a few little roach in the net. And although we're still getting plenty of bites, I think it's time to have a, have a little go on the feeder. See how the pegs are settled down. I'm going to start on the, on the farther line. I expect to catch most of the fish on the near line, but because I've put more bait there, I want to leave that a little bit longer still to settle. So I'm going to start on the far line and uh, get a little bit of bait in on there and see how um, See how that progresses first, because we put a much bigger quantity of bait on the near line, I'm happy to leave that for longer. Now, I'm um, just going to set the rod rest up. You'll notice I've got a much narrower rod rest to normal. Um, most of my fish, especially on steel waters, I'll use the long bar style rod rest. But anywhere where you've got rod up in the air on a river, you want quite a narrow rest. So it's not in the way when you're playing fish or anything like that. I've chosen one with a slot in it as well. So if you want to pull the line just to inch the feeder through or anything like that, that'll, that'll move freely in there as well. So um, I've got uh, 
slightly bigger feeder for a cross. So although we've put a little bit of bait in at the start, I want to get a little bit more quantity of bait in. So I'm starting on a four square feeder for a cross, approximately 60 centimetre tail on both rods. So I've only got 012 to a 16 on. Now for the Norfolk Rivers, uh, for uh, bream and skimmers, you can get away with a size 12, even a 14 on a lot of uh, situations. But the fish in here are fish for a lot. They're a little bit crafty and I'd rather start to catch a few fish and feel my way into the peg first and then scale up if, if the, the, the swimmer's absolutely black with fish. But because you're only fishing a small venue, there's not too many snags in here or anything like that, you can get away with light gear and just build the peg up nicely first. So like I say, on the far line, starting with a four square cage, I'll drop that down to a three square as soon as we're getting bites regularly. And I'm uh, going to start off with uh, a couple of small pieces of dendrobina on the hook. And uh, if the fishing's a bit tricky, I'll switch over to a couple of pieces of red worm on the hook. Nearly always, worm is the best bait for the, the skimmers on here. So just literally nip the head off that piece of worm. About the length of a maggot and a half and then just hook on two bits side by side like that. A little smidge of worms in the ground bait and then away we go. What I've done, I've slightly offset the two swims. Uh, so in effect the further line slightly upstream. So when I wind the feeder in, I'm not winding it back through the, the near line. The near line's a little bit further downstream. So when we're playing fish and winding the feeder through, hopefully it's not disturbing the fish that are settling on the on the near line. So just waiting for that feeder to settle. And then just dropping it in the rest and seeing if that holds bottom. What I've done on any flowing venue, I like to face the rod downstream. You'll see there, it takes all the pressure out of the tip. So if it were to be upstream, the tip would be bent right round like that. And although you'll get a drop back bite, if the fish is mouthing it, or if you get a line bite, you can't see it very well. So by facing it downstream, almost following the length of line down to the feeder, coming back in a bow with the flow, you can see every little indication. So especially with skimmers and bream, when they move into the peg, you get line bites and whatever and you don't want them to dislodge the feeder. So uh, by taking all that pressure out, and you'll see that lovely little drop back bite, and we're into one straight away. So I've actually only got the three quarter ounce tips in this rod, which seem way too light for a river situation. But because the um, superior tips are quite fast taper, you can get away with them for river fishing quite nicely. So if I was on a more powerful river, obviously I'd have a much heavier tip, but this one being such a small, narrow venue, I feel like you can get away with that size of tip. So I've got a nice little skimmer straight away. But you see there that backstop on the rig did its job, had a lovely little drop back bite. But uh, I've actually foul hooked it in the flipper. But uh, there we go. Nice little skimmer to start off with. It's a brilliant sign that there's a few fish there. So uh, hopefully we'll have many more to come. What sometimes happens on here though, they don't like too much commotion. So uh, the reason for having the two, two lines as well is that if I think they've had a bit of a battering on that far line, I can just drop on the near line, catch two or three fish, back to the far line, catch another couple of fish and keep alternating like that to keep a nice steady catch rate coming. But uh, you can see there, I'm just going in, following the feeder to the bottom, but leaving enough slack. So when I put the rod on the rest, it is actually forming a bit of a bow. And that's allowing me to hold bottom with um, much less lead than if you tighten straight up to the feeder. Um, the more powerful the river, the more that needs accentuating. So the bigger the bow that you'll need. You know, if you're fishing somewhere like the Trent, you might not even be able to clip up at all. You might have to cast accurately and then feed out even more line. But 
on a little venue like this where you're not fishing too far out you can do it with a clip quite nicely and just that three or four foot of extra bow that you're feeding in is enough to get it to hold bottom. You can see there the feeder's just crept a little bit. The wind on the line there has just crept that feeder down a little bit so I might just go up to a 40 grammer just to make sure it holds bottom at first. And then if more fish show up we can drop back down but there's a little fish on there now. Another little roach. What I'll also do with these feeders the reason for using a cage feeder is because um, a lot of people will use a, a solid plastic feeder for river fishing. They assume that the flow will wash the bait from the feeder, so they want it encased in a, a solid plastic feeder. But I prefer the much more open wire cage because I feel that you can mix the ground bait to suit the conditions rather than mix the ground bait to suit the feeder. So in a, in a plastic feeder, you've got to have quite a dry mix for it to eject from the feeder nicely. Whereas a cage feeder, I can have my ground bait like stodge virtually and it will still come out of the feeder nicely, which is handy when you're feeding a lot of worms, which you might be doing on here. Um, you might need to feed a lot of worms to get through the roach and get the skimmers. But uh, no matter how claggy that ground bait goes, with a, with a wire cage feeder, that'll always eject nicely from the feeder. So that's the reason on any flowing venue that I'll use a, a wire cage. So I'm just gonna so I'm just persevere with this, see how the swim develops. There's a few little ropes there at the minute, but like I say, I think as more bait goes in, they'll, uh, they'll peter out and give the skimmers a chance to, uh, to move in. So uh, we'll plug away with that carry on feeding as we are and uh, and see what happens and then I'll come back to you in a few minutes once the uh, once the swim settle down and hopefully we're winding a skimmer in every cast got another big skimmer here unfortunately it's hooked in the uh, hooked in thin but it's a good sign it shows there's a few fish there it's a lovely stamp um, lovely stamp skimmer if I can pick it up for the camera. So, a couple of pounds. Hi guys, sorry to interrupt this video. It's just a reminder to make sure you like the video, subscribe to Preston Innovation's YouTube channel, and make sure you hit the notification bell to make sure you never miss another upload. So what I'm looking to try and achieve with the, uh, the feeder on here is to have enough weight to hold the bottom quite securely. If you're fishing for roach and chub and things like that on certain rivers, it's often best to just have a feeder what just holds bottom. But for skimmers, I often find that by slightly overweighting the feeder is a lot better because you get quite a few line bites and things like that from skimmers. Um, so it's best to just have the feed is slightly heavier than what you normally would. You can tell that by just looking at the tip and if the tip starts to creep without having a bite you know your feed is a little bit too light. You want it to go in and sit nicely when you've got that nice bow and then like what we had there you just get a, a nice little drop back bite where the fish pulls it down hits that little knot at the back and gives you a nice drop back bite. So uh, you don't want it to dislodge the feeder if you just have a line bite or if the fish just mouths the bait uh, gently. You, you want it to be a proper bite to get a nice drop back. So there's a, a couple of extra ways what I, um, what I do with the, the feeders because these ones what I'm using today come in quite a nice variety of weights. So you get quite a, quite a lot of variation there. But if you need any more weight, I'll just get little bits of lead strip and cut them up with scissors and just add little bits into the mesh if need be um, just to tweak it for an extra five or ten grams 
Um, and then, like what we had at the weekend, we had an exceptionally high tide here, so you needed even more lead. And the good thing with these feeders, they've got a flat base, so it actually used these weights that you can get from any tyre fitting place. Actually, the weights what they use to balance wheels on cars. So they've got a sticky foam back, and then just five or ten gram weights, and they they stick very nicely to the base of these feeders. So like I say, at the weekend you needed 45 grams to hold here, which is exceptional for this river. But uh, by doing those sort of things, you um, you can just get the feeder balanced nicely, so it, it, it holds bottom quite easily in the conditions. So obviously on this shorter line, we're only nine metres out, we need a lot less lead to hold bottom than when we're fishing across. So I've just got a little 25 gram feeder on there, but the same thing applies, just follow it down so it hits the bottom and then you've got enough room to make that bow to get that feeder to sit there nicely. And the flow will just take up that bow and just bring that tip under a little bit of tension. And now what we're looking for is any, any little indications, any movements first of all, we're not going to pick up on those. And then when we get a very positive bite, hopefully it'll hit that little backstop on the rig and dislodge the feeder and that fish, fish will hook itself. Don't need to strike at those, you just pick the rod up and, and just wind them in. So sitting there nicely, the feeder's not inched along, you've, you've not seen any movements on the tip where the feeder's crept along the bottom. So I'm happy now that that feeder's in position and we're ready for a skimmer. Oh, there was the first little indication. There we go, nice little drop back bite. And although it's a roach, it still proved the uh, effectiveness of the method. It still hooked itself on the, on the drop back. Right, so I've just gone back across on the far line. Just had a little bit of a, little bit of a rest while I've been catching a few fish on that near line. Um, I've got quite a lot of lead on there today for this particular river. Um, I've overweighted the feeder quite a bit because I've got a strong downstream wind as well, which isn't helping matters. So I've got 40 grams of lead, but you can see there just had a little bit of a bite there. Fish dislodged the feeder. That's not on. It was either a little roach or a, a line bite. But, uh, you'll soon see if it's a positive indication where the fish just We'll just approach the bait and turn the rig will hit the little backstop knot and then just give us a really positive drop back bite. You see there the, the flow just picked up that bow just put the gentle bend in the tip by having that rod facing downstream it's just took all the pressure off off the rod and you can see there against the skyline that's just uh, just set nicely now the feeder's not moving so you're not getting any sort of any movements on the tip as though the feeder's creeping along the bottom. Just holding nicely there. And hopefully, any second now, we get just a little forward movement and then a drop back. Where well, fish has picked that up and hit that little backstop and give us a nice drop back bite. A little skimmer. Just a small one. So just going to have a, our last cast of the session. Hopefully, end on a skimmer. Been a nice session today. We've caught off. Um, both feeder lines. We fed the near line quite heavily and then just used that four metre whip line just to let those lines settle, let a few fish uh, come in the swim. And although we got pestered by roach a little bit at first, the more we fished and the more we fed, the less the roach have been a problem and the more skimmers there's been in the peg. So now it's gone in, sat nicely, holding bottom nicely, and hopefully we can just finish on a skimmer.
So the only other little tricks um, to do when you're getting near the end of a session as well, if you've had quite a few fish from one line, you can go like a metre past or a couple of metres past and fish around the bait. But one thing what's worth trying before you do any of that sort of stuff on any river with a little bit of flow on it is just have a little cast downstream. It's not something you want to do very often because obviously you don't want the fish to go further and further downstream but when you get near the end of the session, certainly in the last half an hour or so, something what's often worth a, a, a bonus fish, sometimes an even bigger than average stamp fish. So just fish to the same clip and just cast like a couple of yards downstream is well worth a well worth a go late in the session. But um, the only other things that I haven't had to do today, I've just fished a, a little blob of worms in that cage feeder all day. If the fish had have gone completely and I felt like um, they weren't coming to the ground bait, is to just put a window feeder on and literally fill it full of bait. So either neat worms or worms and casters. And that, that is another alternative. But the only thing to bear in mind with the window feeder, because it's a, a round shape, won't hold bottom as well as those side weighted feeders. So you might have to just go on a heavier weight than what you normally would. I might even not be able to fish it at all across. But it's something definitely worth bearing in mind to, to do on the inside. And you can also use it like a little bait up feeder. So you can put like an XL size one on and literally fill that full of bait. Just put it in like one bait up feeder, empty it straight out and then just, just go back to fishing a normal feeder over the top. Um, well worth a go if you, if you think your swim's died and you need to do something to resurrect the peg that's that's well worth trying and literally so we've just gone in feed has settled nicely we're just waiting for a positive indication just to get a skimmer to end the session on you can tell there that that feed is not moving at all it's not creeping along the bottom or anything like that it's just sitting there nicely not been intercepted by a roach on the way down go and we're in so just a couple of little downward movements as the fish just mouth the bait and then as soon as that fish turns and hits that little backstop just gives you a lovely little drop back bite and the fish has hooked itself so there's no need to strike you don't need to strike hard that's why you don't really need braided line or anything like that for this style of fish and the fish has hooked itself against the backstop. Another lovely skimmer just to end the session on. So we're just coming to an end of a, another fantastic session in a beautiful part of the world. Um, I'm lucky with my fishing that I get to travel all over the country and, and parts of Europe but this really is one of my favourite places here. Um, love fishing in Norfolk and the Norfolk Broads. If you, um, if you want to fish any of the matches here, the, the Human Dynamo, Tony Gibbons, runs a few matches on here. Um, this particular stretch is free fishing as well, so if you want to come pleasure fishing, you can come down here quite easily. You just pay at the, uh, the car park at the boatyard and, uh, and you can fish for free. But, um, but yeah, it's a very special day and uh, hopefully you'll come and join us on our next sort of Broadland adventure as we try out these other venues. and. Uh, Thanks for watching and uh, if you like what you've seen today, don't forget to like and subscribe.